Hello everyone, welcome to the first ever West Australian streaming of the Future Orchards Orchards Walks live online. It's great to have you all online today with us. And we're really sorry that we can't be there with you in person. But the good thing about being virtual is that we can connect with others from both inside your region and outside your region. And we'll be able to see some leading orchards from New Zealand today. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Rose Daniel. I'm the technical manager with APEL. The theme for this round of Orchard Walks is The Future Is Now. During today's Orchard Walk, you'll be hearing from Ross Wilson, who will provide a quick update on the PIPS2 projects, Dr Nigel Schwartz from TIA, who will provide a summary from, of the outcomes from the PIPS2 fertigation research project and present the Sonata tool, Steve Spark from AgFirst, who will explore the current and future issues, including labour, trees, quality, climate and technology, and Susie Murphy-Wyatt from Poem West, who will provide an update on the latest trials being run in Western Australia. Steve and Ross will also then take you on a virtual tour of New Zealand's, a couple of New Zealand's leading orchards, discussing the pros and cons of different systems and demonstrating the latest critical winter tasks, particularly winter pruning. Before we move on to our guest presenters, I quickly wanted to run through some of the activities that have been happening within APAL over the last few months. As you are probably aware, much of Eastern Australia was affected by bushfires over the last summer. APAL was involved in assessing damage and preparing a submission to government to support recovery. And the, um, the New South Wales government has already announced that it will um, support um, recovery and building back orchards in the, the Batlow and Bilpin regions. In May, APAL staff have been trained in the Emergency Plant Pest Response Deed by Plant Health Australia, and we're currently developing a standard operating procedure to ensure that the industry is better prepared in the event of an exotic plant pest entering Australia. And these two emergency, these types of emergencies have made us more aware of the value of understanding what constitutes the apple and pear industry, and a tree census pilot study is uh, commencing shortly. That means that we'll be more prepared to respond to emergencies in the future because we'll have a better understanding of, of where orchards are located and how big those orchards are. There's also a lot happening in the future business space. The future business team are continuing to collect insurance related data to understand how much businesses are paying for insurance and what type of coverage is being accessed. If you would like more information about this, please get in touch with Rochelle Zilli uh, in the APAL office. Finally, we value any feedback that you've got about the Future Orchards program so that we can continue to make sure that we're providing relevant content to you. Okay, so now without further ado, and don't forget to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, I'd like to introduce our first speaker to kick off today's Orchard Walk. So Ross Wilson, who most of you probably already know, is a founding member of Ag First in New Zealand and brings over 30 years horticultural experience to the business. He's a grower in his own right and has frontline experience with the issues face, faced by orchardists and offers his growers, grower clients a complete consultancy service. Grower education is a passion and Ross is a key driver of APAL's Future Orchards program. He regularly leads field days for various projects, ensuring that the latest technical advances, advances and good tree management techniques make it to the hands of growers. Over to you, Ross. Okay, so welcome to, uh, to this first virtual Focus Orchard uh, event. Quite strange talking to a blank screen, I must admit. I think I prefer talking to you in person. But um, hopefully there's a few familiar faces in the audience and... Um, and we'd really encourage you to ask some questions. Uh, the Northern Loop group were very, very quiet, so we'd like WA to show us that uh, they are out there, that we're not talking to a black screen, and that you're, um, you've got the odd question for us. Uh, I'll be very brief today, because one of, the, one of the great things of a virtual webinar is that people like, um, Nigel can actually make himself available and he has done so now for both loops. So rather than, you know, dedicating a whole week, um, it's a couple of hours a day, which is a lot less. So, you know, it's very efficient to, uh, for those sort of people. So Nigel will be presenting his work today. So I just want to give you a very quick summary of where we're at with the PIPS uh, R&D program. As you'll be aware, the uh, artificial spur extinction study that Dr. Sally Bound did was completed a couple of years ago. 
the peer work that Dr. Ian Goodwin did in the Goulburn Valley uh, also was completed a little while ago. Both of those projects, the results of those have been previously disseminated. So um, they're all available and if you haven't caught up with those, you will find them online. The Codlin Moth Biological Control work uh, that Dr. David Williams is leading using, uh, using a, a biological control agent called Mastris Redens is ongoing. But of course, because there is no Codlin Moth in WA, uh, that, that particular piece of work is not, uh, not, you know, not important to WA, so we won't spend any time on that. The water and nutrient R&D work that Nigel's going to talk to you about, I think you'll get a lot out of it. It's a very detailed presentation, so you'll need to have your brain uh, fully engaged when he's talking. Um, and we're really looking forward to the modelling tool that's about to be released for that. So I'll, I won't steal his thunder. Um, and that will be presented uh, shortly. And then the other big piece of work that I've previously talked to you about is this biennial bearing study that's been uh, done by or led by uh, Dario Stefanelli in, in Australia, Stefanelli, but, but also uh, jointly researched with the uh, University of uh, Hohenheim, I think is in Germany. Uh, so that's a really detailed piece of work that will be presented in September uh, 2020 at the Orchard Walk Bend. Um, so again, I won't, uh, I won't present it today, not going to, because we've got a plan for that to be done in September 2020. Okay, the only other thing I want uh, you to be aware of is that um, there is a very good website that has been established, um, led again by Dr. David Williams, but the entomologists, a number are involved. Again, it's an Hort Innovation Project, um, and this particular website is a great resource. I've jumped onto it myself, seen a couple of case studies by uh, the Martella family in WA and also Mark Scott in his orchard. So some good local stuff that's on there. Um, the whole pest and disease complex is, it's extremely complex. No different in New Zealand to what it is in Australia. And, and the general message that we've all got to get our heads around with pest and disease management these days is that we've all got to have a really good understanding of, <clears throat> of the chemistry that we're using, uh, how, uh, how effective it is against the pest, but also whether it's got any, um, any nasty effect on the biological control agents that we're looking to stimulate within our orchards. So it's very important that as growers, you understand that dynamic um, and David said to me uh, this morning is, is really encourage each of you to have an integrated pest management plan in place for your orchard with good input from your local people so that you're doing the absolute best you can, not only for your pests, but also for the good guys that are really uh, doing a lot to control those pests. So with that, I'll now pass over to Nigel. Oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for the um, opportunity to uh, be able to present to you this morning. Uh, it's a really great privilege to, to be here and, uh, and talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing as part of, um, I guess, the, the apple nutrition and the fertigation uh, part of the PIPS program. So PIPS uh, stands for uh, Productivity, Irrigation, uh, Pests and Soils. And uh, obviously, uh, this is sort of a, a, the nitrogen, irrigation and soils components of the PIPS program. And, um, We've been running this project for about four years now and it's sort of coming to a close now. I actually think um, I met a fair few of you um, if you were if you're on these orchard works about three years ago where I came um, I came to uh, the uh, this the WA or to the Manjimup area and also the Perth Hills area and um, yeah talked a little bit about what this project was going to do actually and so now uh, three or so years on uh, it's nice to be here to talk about what we've done and uh, where we've got to so far. So um, look, this project is about, I guess, um, uh, apple tree nutrition, and it, we're really aiming for improved productivity. Um, and we're going to do this, and I want to talk to you about this, um, I guess, online tool that we've put together 
um, which I guess is a is a accumulation of the last three or four years of work. And it's certainly not all my work. Um, uh, I'm a research fellow at, at TIA in, um, in, at the University of Tasmania. Um, the brains trust behind the tool, the online tool is, was developed by Steve Green from Plant and Food Research New Zealand. Uh, Marcus Hardy, also from TIA, has done a, a whole stack of uh, soil characterization work, which I'll be presenting soon. Uh, Bi Zheng Tan was a PhD student on the project and, uh, and Dougal Close is our research supervisor. So the primary model, um, the primary tool being developed from this project is called SONATA, which stands for um, the Strategic Irrigation and Nitrogen Assessment Tool for Apples. Um, it's a decision support tool that uh, I guess will guide advisors and growers on how to optimise um, irrigation and nitrogen resources um, for each of the major apple growing regions of Australia. The focus of SONATA is, is really to understand how water and nutrient, so nitrogen application, uh, particularly with types, uh, rates and timings can be managed to satisfy tree demand, um, mitigate leaching uh, and also optimise productivity without a cost to fruit quality. Uh, this, this model requires climate and soil data, which is based on local databases and, uh, and also characterisation um, and requires information from, from, from you guys, from the growers, about your tree variety, uh, the kinds of, of yields you expect and, and various aspects of, of management. But to really, um, I guess, put this tool into context, we, we had to do a whole stack of background research on how an apple tree uses nitrogen and how an apple tree uses um, water. So um, this diagram on the left here, obviously we are in this sort of autumn winter period at the moment, the leaves might be a few leaves hanging on, hanging on. Um, but at this point, all the nitrogen that, that was in those leaves have been withdrawn uh, into storage organs. And so this, that nitrogen is sitting quite happily at the moment in your, in your roots, in your trunk and in your branches, your, your main perennial branches that don't get pruned. And, uh, and then that nitrogen will be used for the first six to eight weeks of spring, new spring growth. So generally we can be fairly sure that that first energy flush, that first um, uh, bit of spring growth usually is maintained or provided by um, stored nitrogen up until about uh, three to four weeks after full bloom. And, uh, and from that point on, that's when uh, we know that root uptake of nitrogen occurs. And so, you know, this, this, this remobilized end forms a lot of this uh, flowering bud development and, and also your early leaf development. And so what we're interested in here is nitrogen use efficiency. So this is the amount of nitrogen that gets removed by your crop through harvest, plus the amount of nitrogen that gets used by the tree relative to the amount of nitrogen that gets put on. Um, and so this is what's, and so then of course, there's other forms of other, other ways in which that tree can take up nitrogen. Obviously that recycling component is really important. And then your tree can take up nitrogen from the soil through mineralized sources. But from a nitrogen use efficiency perspective, we're really interested in how your apple tree uses nitrogen relative to the amount that goes on. Then the other key aspect, and it's obviously inter, inter, interrelated, is the amount of water the apple tree uses. So this water is uh, water that comes from your irrigation sources um, or rainfall and gets taken up by the tree through transpiration. And, um, and so we've measured that using sap flow sensors. So we now have a really good understanding of how much water a young tree uses. Um, and then when a tree starts cropping right through until a tree is 10 to 11 years old with a full 70 to 80 tonne a hectare crop. And we've done that through this sap flow, uh, sap flow sensing. Okay, so the next aspect of, of the, you know, the tool is really about knowing exactly what kind of soil um, you're growing your apples in. So we have gone um, so far to all the Southeast Australian apple growing regions. We, we had funding from Port Innovation to go to four regions um, and we didn't, we, which meant we couldn't go to Stanthorpe and we couldn't get to WA. However, uh, Hort Innovation have just issued us a, a variation to the contract and um, we're working with Susie Murphy-White at the moment and uh, um, another um, a soil physiologist and we're going to go and do all this work in your um, WA soils as well. So that's, that's going to happen in the next month or so. So what we've done in these major apple growing regions is looked at 
the morphology of the soil. We've dug a great big trench um, in various, in, in, in over 31 different orchards and in blocks. And we've looked at what the soil actually looks like. We've done a, a, a up to about 90 centimetres. We've done a soil profile description. At three different profile depths, we've looked at soil chemistry, to know exactly what's going on uh, with your, um, obviously all your macronutrients and micronutrients and pH and, and all that sort of stuff, which is really obviously important for growing our apples. And also the aluminium content, which is really um, important as a, as a nutrient uptake inhib inhibitor. And then what's most critical to this tool is your hydrology of the soil. So this is how, how much water your soil holds, um, what your soil does with water. Does, it, uh, does the water move through the soil quite quickly? Um, are, there, are there any major drainage points? Or, um, and, and what kind of, and what are the, the irrigation set points? So what are your wilting points and, and what's your, your refill points as well? We've got all that information from this hydrological study. And then we've made, from all this information up top, the morphology, chemistry and hydrology, we've made some management recommendations on how we can be improving our soil health for growing our apple trees. So all this information gets put into the backbone or the background of the tool. So this is a sheet that you actually can't see, but um, it sits in the, in the Excel, um, in the Excel uh, tool. And essentially it lists all the different soil types that we can actually input into the, into the, um, the, soil, into the uh, tool. And we've got all the Victorian ones here because they've come from a, a database, but there's another 30 or 40 more that you guys will be able to have a look at pictures of um, and then say, okay, this looks like my soil type. I want to select that soil. So this software comes preloaded with all these soils from the five different apple growing regions and we'll soon have all the WA soils to add into this. Um, you'll be able to pull down a menu to select your chosen soil series. Um, and then, uh, and then a, a whole stack of other soil comes from the soil database uh, from Victoria. So this information includes um, like your clay content, your organic carbon content, your organic N, um, your saturation point, and the soil matrix potential. So this is really the pressure, how, this is how much, the, the pressure of that water at different depths. So the other aspect of, of what's I mean, really important is soil is really important and obviously the climate that you're growing the apples in is really important. So we've preloaded, and this is another sheet that you can't see, um, is uh, we've preloaded historical data from 22 climate stations around the country. So it's, these have been downloaded from um, the BOM database. Records that we've downloaded include values of um, ETO, so transpiration, um, air temperature, uh, rainfall from the harvest seasons from over the last sort of 18 to 20 years. Um, of course, this sheet is, is, hidden, is hidden, but you, you get the idea of what it looks like. So, you know, here's the date up the top from 1999 right through until 2018, scrolled down. And all this background information is used to give us a bit of a picture of what is going to happen on an average year in uh, the site or the climate region that you select. All right, so um, what we need to be able to demonstrate is that we actually know how much an apple tree, how much water an apple tree uses. So our sap flow data has done exactly this. So if you look at um, the black line, so the black line on this two-year-old apple tree chart shows exactly how much water from September through to September through to June your apple tree is, is using. And the same goes for the three-year-old apple trees. And at this point, we had a crop on the tree. So you can see there's a fair bit of variation here, and that, that's because um, if you have a hot day or a windy day or a, a wet day, a cloudy day, um, that's going to have a big impact on how much water a tree uses. And we're talking you know, magnitudes of, of two, three hundred percent. So we know that um, you know, come mid-January, when it's the, the hottest part of the year, we're using for a young tree, a two-year-old, about five litres um, of water per day. And we know now, looking at the red line, we can accurately model that. And that red line is the modeled line there. And so that increases dramatically for a three-year-old apple tree with a crop on, we're up to sort of eight to 10 liters per day. And so, you know, and right through until 11 to 12-year-old tree, we now know that that uses between 30 and 40 liters a day. And so this is what the tool actually looks like. This is, we, we know at different set points um, throughout the tree age, we've been able to track and we can model exactly how much water a tree uses. 
So then the next part of the of the work is is really trying to understand the impact of irrigation and, and nitrogen on what kind of yields we can be expecting. So what we've been able to do is is utilize the the um, orchard net database, which many of you have probably um, inputted uh, some of your data, particularly those who have focus orchards in in your area, have inputted that data into the orchard net database, and this gives us a pretty good understanding of what kind of yields we can be expecting for different varieties of different ages. So for example, um, a 10 year old Granny Smith tree, we know oh, this is all over the country. Um, it yields somewhere between 75 to, uh, to 100 tonnes a hectare. And we know that that sort of starts to plateau and, and probably even decrease when you get to about 20 to 25 years old. Whereas a pink lady, really starts to peak at about six to seven years between 75 to 100 tonne a hectare. And we can see that that, you know, that probably decreases a little bit as the tree gets to about 25 years old. Um, so at the moment, we've only got data on four, uh, a good data, solid data on four varieties. So the more data that gets put into that Orchard Net website, the better the data is, and the better we can try and get some really solid curves for your different varieties. Okay, so, um, then here, uh, we really needed to understand what an apple tree does with nitrogen from you know, the start of the season through to the end of the season. So what I'm showing here is the, the leaf nitrogen dynamic, dynamics and exactly what um, the impact of fertilizer is uh, during the course of the season on your, on your apple tree leaves. So we set up a trial where we used um, 15N. So this is a, a, a nitrogen source, which is just like your fertilizer source. It's actually labeled with a stable isotope of nitrogen. So this is a, a different form of nitrogen that does exactly the same thing as 14N, um, as your fertilizer N, but we can actually track the movement of that nitrogen through the tree, through the leaves. So we applied um, nitrogen through a fertigation, drip irrigation system, just like you would normally do uh, four weeks after full bloom. This is the period of time where we know that that root uptake um, sort of starts. And we can really see, look, your, your average kind of leaf percentage of nitrogen sort of sitting at about 2.5% for um, our 100% our pre-harvest. So we did a pre-harvest, we did a mixed pre and post-harvest, and we did a post-harvest only application, all of 50 units a hectare. And we tend to think that that's, you know, the, on the, the highest, Kind of amount that you really need and we you did that much because you want to obviously to see a see a result and you can really see quite clearly in those first few weeks after fertigation leaf end spiking here um, then this is total end remember so this is the, the the native end so this is the end that's been recycled plus it's the nitrogen that we're adding through fertilizer and uh, and you can see the difference between our our 100 percent so our full pre-harvest rate versus the 50 percent rate so we know our pre-harvest fertigation treatments are actually having an impact on our leaf end. Um, what is interesting is this little spike here. So what we know is that the fruit came off the tree um, at about week 19, week 20, right? And at this point, what we've seen is this, you know, reallocation of nitrogen after the fruit's been removed it back into the leaves. And this is regardless of treatment. So. Now, this is what's really quite fascinating about um, looking at tracking that nitrogen movement over the over the form of the tree. So, um, so anyway, the next the next stage is then looking at exactly um, what happens to that fertilizer end that you've applied. So, you know, we've applied fertilizer in four weeks after full bloom. We can really see that that fertilizer end peaking up to about six to nine weeks after uh, fertigation. It continues, and then that starts decreasing again towards the rest of the year. And you can see the difference between a 100% rate and a 50% rate. But what I really want to draw your attention to is this orange line here. So this is the summer. So this is the post-harvest application event. What you can really see is that we're not seeing much nitrogen uptake at all. And so this is actually a bit of a concern, particularly for those who have as, as a strategy your you know, post-harvest end application to really drive um, storage. Well, we know that that this is probably having very little, is very little um, uh, effective uptake at all. And this is further emphasized by the actual partitioning of that nitrogen um, during winter dormancy. So all these trees that we've treated with nitrogen, we actually dug up out of the ground in, um, 
in at winter dormancy in, Ju in June, July. And we, we excavated them and then split them up um, into their various organs. And so this first pie chart here is the pre-harvest only application. And what you can see is that we, of, of all the fertilizers that we applied, we, we were able to recover 9.7 grams of nitrogen per tree. And that was almost twice as much, so 5.3 grams a tree, of the fertilizer that actually was recovered from a post-harvest only treatment. So you can see that nitrogen use efficiency was a lot, lot higher, almost twice as good in a pre-harvest application. And where did, that all, where did all that nitrogen go? Well, most of the nitrogen went into the fruit. You can really see what a strong sink that pre-harvest nitri pre nitrogen allocation to fruit really is. But the other really important thing to see is that uh, this pre-harvest nitrogen also made its way into storage. And that's really important. And it's a different way of thinking because quite often you think, well, you do your post-harvest end to build your storage reserves. But what this is demonstrating is that actually we can build post-harvest or dormant winter storage reserves through a pre-harvest nitrogen application. And we also know that the difference in fruit quality outcomes between these two were, neg were negligible. So obviously the concern is that you, all this nitrogen goes into the fruit. Um, are we going to see delayed ripening? Are we going to see softer fruit? Are we going to see diff um, you know, little colour? Well, our data suggests that we didn't. Um, and so you know, we also know that, okay, we can clearly see that your post harvest actually did put some allocation into storage, but 41.3% of 5.3 grams is actually not that much different to 15% of 9.7 grams. Slightly different, but not that much. So we can actually satisfy tree demand for storage through a pre-harvest, and this is what we're advocating. So all this data has then gone into um, our model, our tool. And so here's our tool tracking leaf nitrogen content over a season, and here's our tool tracking leaf fruit, I'm oh, sorry, fruit nitrogen content over a season. And, uh, and this is really important. And, and we know that for different varieties, we can recalculate um, uh, leaf, leaf N as a, a, a using drone degree days for other varieties and other locations. We can do the same thing for, for fruit data as well. You know, but again, um, this is really important. Any kind of fruit N or leaf N data that you have, please put it up on OrchardNet because we've only got data for Gala and Galaxy at the moment. And the more data we can get from more varieties, the better the tool can be. Okay, so this is the front end of the tool. This is where you guys get to make your, make your decisions. And we need to know some information from you about um, what uh, your trees are and what your tree ages are, your plants, your tree spacing, and then you, obviously your, your row spacing is really important. And then um, it's really important for us to know your irrigation infrastructure because this is the amount of water that you're gonna be putting onto your orchard. And actually, just in that context, we're actually going to put a poll up soon to ask you some really interesting questions about, uh, and for as a conversation starter, about your water use. So we really want to know um, how big a deal a water and the cost of water is for your business. We want to know if um, how much water your orchard uses, or if you know how much water your orchard uses, and um, and if you've got any specific irrigation strategies to really try and uh, improve your water use efficiency. So stay tuned for that. And I'm sure Larissa from APAR will put that up at some point soon. Um, and so, you know, you can then go and see a view uh, how much water your orchard is going to use through this tool um, in either megalitres per hectare or, um, or millimetres, however you like to understand that. And so here's what your, so you can press to update that and recalculate that. And here are your tree parameters. So we can estimate that the root depth of a particular age tree of a particular variety of particular rootstock is going to be about 1.06 meters. Um, we expect that a yield of this six-year-old tree is going to be at about, up at about 50 tonne a hectare and with an upper quartile of about 63 tonne a hectare. And what I really want to draw your attention to is this number here. So this number is really critical for you to be able to work with your advisor or make some decisions around how much nitrogen you put on your tree. So we know that, that a six-year-old Fuji at this tree and, and uh, row spacing at this tons a hectare is probably going to be removing about 22 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare when the fruit comes off the tree. 
So we need to be thinking about how we're going to be replacing that nitrogen. We know that that tree also has a demand for about 46 units of nitrogen from leaf. But as I've discussed before, we really know that our nitrogen that we get from the fertilizer is not the only nitrogen that the tree gets. So that recycled nitrogen maintains about 50% of your tree nitrogen requirements for the year. Your, your mineralized nitrogen makes up another probably 25, 30%. And then you, all you really need to do is top it up with your fertilizer nitrogen. So we're only talking somewhere between 30 to 40 to 50 units a hectare is probably all you need maximum. And we're advocating a, a pre-harvest application sort of four weeks after full bloom, just very small weekly app applications um, through a drip fertigation system. And that's to get the most out of your nitrogen to be as efficient as possible um, to make sure that you, know, you can do this, get this replacement sorted. And uh, we've also got some estimates of your uh, phenology here based on where you are and also your soil hydrology. So the fill capacity of your soil, a refill point and wilting point. And you know, this is a really good conversation about you can have with your irrigation advisor. Uh, he'll be really interested to, to see and they'll, they'll understand this really, really well. So with this information, you can calculate your set points for irrigation that depend on Know, your soil water holding capacity, your drought tolerance, and your root depth. Okay, so moving on. So this is kind of like a bit, this is a bit of an output of the tool. So you'll, you'll put all these inputs in, you'll look at that, that, that little chart at the bottom, and you'll go to the next sheet. And this is, again, here's your values, and you recalculate that. And this is what, this is some of the information you can have a discussion with your irrig irrigator about. Um, we know that for, that at this, this climatic zone, in this soil type, that, that this site gets about 457 millimetres of rain a year, um, and that it requires about 412 millimetres of water over the course of the season to meet that tree's, uh, that orchard, that block's um, uh, requirements. And you know, here's what the tree water use is gonna look like over a season. And we know that you know, at that site, Goulburn, Lemford, Tatura, that we're looking anywhere between 20 to 40 um, liters per day in terms of how much water that tree is going to use. That's obviously going to really drop off over the winter period. But we can also see the variability in the climate over the last five or six years. And that's really going to drive um, water use. And it's great that we've got this kind of 20 years background data to really understand exactly what your site's going to look like. So here's the next chart that also helps you understand how much, how much water you probably need to be putting on on a month by month basis. So again, we know that this site uses about 457, um, gets, receives about 457 millimeters of rain, and you can actually see how that's distributed in with the blue bars. Um, and then we know exactly uh, how much water that tree is gonna be using. And these, these are these green bars here on a month by month basis, and how we can meet the demand of that water use by the red bars here, your irrigation. So by the time you, you think about your water and your irrigation, we've met our tree water use requirements. And so for this to happen, we need about 32 millimetres of water um, in, in September, starting here. And then that goes you know, through to about 88 in January here. So you know, this, is, you know, this is part of, part of a conversation that you can have with your, your either if you guys know this really well yourselves, or whether you want to take this to your irrigator and have a have a um, have a conversation with them about that. So you know, looking at um, a bit of a different scenario in Tassie, um, we know that we're at about 750 millimetres of rainfall. That's what the site receives. So that means we're going to need a whole stack less irrigation. And uh, if we look at that on a month by month basis, you know, we're really only talking about one or two millimetres in September, October, and and then you know. A maximum about 42 millimetres, and uh, you know a very different scenario in, in Tassie, um, but you know that cool and that and that consistent rainfall also means that we don't need to use as much water. So yeah, again, really keen to hear from you guys about how big a deal um, water is on your in your sites, and uh, what kind of irrigation strategies that you use to try and save water and conserve water. Um, so look, you know that's probably enough for me. I, Obviously, it'd be a lot better to be able to have, uh, to be sitting in front of you um, at a table with the Excel sheet and we can do a bit of a play, put all your climate 
um, data in, put your orchard information in and see what the, the tool spits out. Um, but obviously we can't do that. The COVID scenario meant is, it means that I can't give you anything to download yet, uh, yet or, or sit down with you, but you know, there will be some time in the next uh, few months, hopefully when things open up again, where it's likely they'll be able to sit down with Susie and, and go through this with her in more detail and, and even some, some uh, growers who are really interested. Uh, this, this tool is going to be sitting on the APAL website. Uh, we're going to be sharing the link. So it'll be a very easy download and very easy to use. Um, but what we really want to know is what is important to assess. We want to know what kind of scenarios you're really interested in. The tool is certainly not going to be, okay, this is the amount of water we've had this season so far. How much water am I going to need for the rest for this week or next week or the week after? It's not a real-time decision support tool. It's, a, it's an overarching strategic approach to how much water and how much nitrogen your orchard's going to use over a season. The next stage of that is going to happen. That's, that's the next stage. That's where we want to get to. It's, a, it's that real-time decision support. But we have to do this bit first. Um, so some key knowledge gaps. We need to know root depth for your different uh, apple trees. Do you have any soil restrictions? Like, Do you have any compaction? Are there any root limitations? Um, you know, do you guys um, root prune? I mean, all those things are really important for us to understand. And then we want to be able to inbuild some flexibility to adjust irrigation set points. So you know, we want you to be able to tell us what kind of yields that you want from your orchard. And if you can tell us that, that's going to have an impact on our irrigation set points. And then there's also obviously some opportunities for metrics where we can look at and calculate water use efficiency and a cost benefit analysis to the amount of water that goes on. And, and that you need uh, to produce that crop. So look, I'm going to leave it like I'll leave it at that for now. Um, please uh, feel free to ask me any questions. Feel free to get in touch with Susie if you have any more data. Susie's already told me that a few of you guys have given her a whole stack of data, which I'm going to use to to put into the backbone of the model. So you know, there's really relevant inf information so far for WA sites. Um, so please keep in touch with Susie about that and. Uh, and any questions, like don't hesitate to give me a ring and chat on the mobile or um, be in touch with Susie who can forward the question to me. Uh, thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thanks very much, Nigel. Um, we, we've just got the poll results in and they're quite interesting. 89% of the respondents know how much their orchard, uh, how much water their orchard uses, but 50%, 56% of the respondents don't have a water budget. You got, you got any comments um, to make on that? Yeah, no, that's not surprising, actually. I mean, uh, that, that's, you know, it's, I mean, it's obviously fantastic that you know how much water um, uh, that your orchard uses. I mean, that's a really, really, really good start. And that's, you know, that's what's going to be really all, um, important about you putting this information into the tool. So we can adjust some, some strategies. We can actually see if we can get that number down lower. Uh, and uh, you know, that we obviously want to be improving uh, efficiency as much as possible. Um, your, your results show that um, there's been quite some concern about nitrogen applications on the quality of fruit and the colour of fruit and your, your results are showing that that might not be um, the case. And we've got some questions about um, applying pre-harvest nitrogen and how that might affect lenticel damage. Do you, have, you, have you seen any um, responses following that? Yeah, nitrogen? look, we haven't actually looked at lenticel damage. I mean, I think, I think what's really important to note is that when we've looked, when there's been, I mean, there's been bucket loads of studies done on nitrogen, nitrogen application in, in apple orchards, in other fruit orchards, and there's you know, there's always a you know, very regularly there's a there's a response that it has a negative impact on fruit quality. We're all quite aware of that, but what we're talking about here is significantly less nitrogen um, uh, apl uh, like application to begin with. So we're we're only talking somewhere between 30 to 50 units a hectare applied. Um, like, you know, split. So that, that application is split into four to eight weeks between, you know, four to five weeks after full bloom through to say, the end of January, the end of um, December. So we're not advocating really high amounts of nitrogen, actually advocating much lower amounts uh, delivered very like frequently in really small doses. And so with that, with that kind of strategy in place, we are not seeing a negative impact on fruit quality. Um, we actually haven't looked at lenticel damage. I think that's a really good question. Um, I think that's certainly something that uh, we do want to look at down the track. Um, but the other question that, that, that's up there is, was soil organic matter measured at the time? 
Um, and if yes, was there any change depending on nitrogen application? Well, but what we did what we did look at is um, is soil organic matter at various points throughout the that throughout the trial. So we we did this trial over three to four years. Um, we we measured the soil organic matter at at that that time of um, whenever we went out to soil sample soil. We didn't actually notice any difference in nitrogen in, in any impact of nitrogen application on soil organic matter. Um, and again, I think that's probably because we're using such low rates. Um, we, you know, I think that you know, that question about does the system take into account the health of the intro area? Well, we can only model the, the predicted water use of both your trees and your inter row. So if you've got a, if you've got a healthy inter row, you're probably going to be using more water, no doubt. Um, but if there's more grass or if there's more weeds, you're probably going to be using more water. And so our tool is just, um, I guess, modeling a predicted um, transpiration uh, EC content of that interrow. So if you have a, a very unhealthy interrow or a, you know, where you're not likely to be using any water, then uh, we'd have to make some adjustments for that. But you know, the other risk about that is if you've got a very unhealthy interrow, you could also be losing water other ways. It could be draining, it could be leaching, it could be that there's no there's, there's no ability for the soil to hold water in a, in an unhealthy intro area. So, you know, there's catch twenty twos there. And there's just a, a comment as well about that the system may allow for better allocation of water, particularly around the early flowering period, rather than total water use. Yeah, as in as in your your existing irrigation systems, or say for, for example this tool. I mean, um, I think that's true. Like you, you know, it'd be really. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a challenging one because you're probably not using as much water during that early flowering period. I mean, uh, as, as what you would be when your crops, you know, a 70 to 80 tonne a hectare crop and it's a really hot day and windy day and you're going to be using a bucket load of water then. But regardless, regardless, what we do know is that we have been able to measure and effectively record how much water those trees use, whether it's a, a young tree, whether it's an old tree, or whether it's an early flowering period or whether it's in the height of summer, we know, we know and we can predict exactly how much water a tree is going to use. So from that, we can calculate total water use. So you know, um, uh, Susie has given me some fantastic data from some of your orchards. And I'm going to be really excited to see uh, what that looks like in the tool and, uh, and, um, and see what it looks like from a WA perspective. Susie, so appreciate those questions. Keep them coming. Yeah, Susie, are there any people in the room with you that have any questions for Nigel? They don't have to come on camera. <laughs> no, it's all right, bros. It's just me and John. I think all everybody right. have decided to hook in at home, which is great. You camera shy. <laughs> all right, Ross, um, Steve, do you have any other comments? Otherwise, um, we might move on. Yeah, I have one, Nigel. It's the first time I've seen your talk. And one of my questions is, um, you've got the ET there, 12 or 1300 millimetres, and then you have rainfall of 4 or 500. You're saying the trees are only using about 80% of the ET, including the rainfall? Is that what you're saying in your model? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think that I'm going to have to ask that question to Steve, I think, because I'm not quite sure how exactly how he's calculated that. But what I do know is that he's put in both the ET of the tree, he's had to obviously model how much water the tree is, plus he's also made a prediction on how much water the inter is going to be using as well. And maybe that's where some of those discrepancies are. And I think you know, that's one of the really challenging aspects is, is trying to understand how much water your inter or your grass sward uses. Um, we can obviously do that really effectively in the tree through sap flow, but getting that numbers, getting those numbers hundred percent right on your, on your, on your tree line, on your inter sward is really difficult because we can't, Factor in when you when you mow or um, or what your what your weed control strategy is going to be, um, whether you have a bare strip under your tree line or or whether you don't like to have much in your inter row at all. So, you know, the more information we can get from growers about their strategies on that, the better we can fill that that data set. Yeah, thanks. Okay, um, we might move on to Steve now. Thank you very much, Nigel. If anyone has any data that they can share with Nigel, please get in touch with Susie or Nigel or with us at APAL and we'll, we'll um, put you in touch with Nigel. 
um, the more data obviously makes a better model. So um, anything that you've got to share, otherwise it sounds like Nigel will be over in the West as soon as he possibly can be <laughs> and um, get some, um, so, some data directly from you there. Okay, thanks very much, Nigel. It's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Steve Spark, who will, um, from AgFirst, and he'll be talking about the future orchard, where we are now and where we are going. So Steve Spark is a consultant with AgFirst, for those of you who haven't met him. He's, he has over 20 years experience in pip fruit and kiwi fruit. He works with clients to provide intensive orchard consultancies on orchard management, pruning, thinning, harvest management, pest and, and pest and disease management. Steve's strong financial management skills also provide financial planning and monitoring, budgeting, performance analysis and purchase appraisals for a range of clients. So over to you, Steve. Okay, this is... Um a shared talk that Jonathan Brooks did uh, a fortnight ago, and I've altered it a little bit for uh, my talk, but um, basically it's an introduction into um, what Futures Orchards has been trying to achieve and sustainability. And in the past few years, we've been looking at quality, climate, trees, labor, and technology. Um, going forward, um, do, well, just to recap on that, fruit quality is a, has been a mindset of the consumers or the customers. And, We've often said this before, some people like shopping at McDonald's and eating there, whereas other people like uh, a decent restaurant. Quality is pretty much in the mind of the consumer and they can have different standards. But what we all have to do producing apples is actually get closer to the consumers. And in this slide here, we're looking at uh, getting more information going through the supply chain, um, trying to uh, spend more time learning about what our consumers want, um, and then we adjust our orchards to try and make uh, more fruit from what consumers want. And then we continually look to improve. Um, one of those methods is using varieties. And we've talked about variety clubs before and the different strengths and weaknesses of them. Um, at the end of the day, uh, the quality systems that uh, club varieties have is that they need to add value to the grower. And I suppose the worst mistake growers can make is not actually belonging to any clubs at all and finding that the neighbour or someone else is getting higher value returns in the market for their varieties, which you are unable to grow. And we've hammered that one quite a bit in past meetings. I suppose the old adage uh, hasn't changed no matter what you're selling. Uh, it's the customer's always right. Uh, they always have their eye on what they presume uh, the quality standards are and um, you need to meet them. If you don't meet them, someone else will. And that's been the lesson we've seen right around the world. Um, coming into climate, uh, as you guys are aware, the climate is uh, playing quite a few issues for, for you and it is for us as well. Um, but we need to understand what each location has. And in a meeting we had um, last week, it was interesting, one grower raised a comment to me, this Australian grower, whether that was the, he was growing his orchard in the right location. Uh, those are the sorts of things you need to weigh up and uh, manage your risk accordingly and choose varieties that are suitable for your location. To sort of summarise what we're looking at in climate is there is risk and reward. Some climates are a lot easier to grow apple trees than others um, and some are a lot more challenging. Um, each, each specific orchard has its own um, uh, situation and needs to be understood. Through measuring and managing um, your seasonal risks, you're able to plan effectively and develop strategies. And there's been lots of new technologies, such as, um, or lots of technologies such as hail netting and choose a root, choice of rootstocks and different things like that, which can handle some of these climatic risks. So variety choice and orchard systems are really important. And again, we stress all the way through that continuous improvement is needed. Uh, variety choice and systems constantly change throughout time and understanding the risk and reward for them. It is interesting though that we do need to seize opportunities when they come up um, and I'm reminded uh, quite a bit about the growers. Um, when I look at this picture here, um, orchards when we first started, Ross and I first started traveling to Australia with Futures Orchards, this was a typical type of orchard. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see how orchard shape and desire has changed. What was interesting here is when all the branches were pointing at the sun and the sky, there was very little fruit. As soon as we got the branches pointing down at the ground, they started to become more fruitful. 
uh, I think you'll all agree that uh, this type of orchard without some manipulation or training or, or uh, even replanting uh, is not likely to be the orchard of the future. So existing orchards, we need to continually keep improving. Um, we need to monitor block performance. There are lots of tools for that. Um, each block has to be working to its best potential. Um, all growers every year should be analysing the orchard blocks and determining whether they're still up to muster or not. Um, the fires have been going quite strong in New Zealand this year with lots of varieties, uh, particularly Braeburn being pulled out and burnt and new plantings being put in. But what we all need to do is keep our eye and ears open uh, for improvements, keep an eye on what the consumers are wanting, uh, work out what our climate changes are and keep checking on our systems and especially on new technology that's coming. Labor is going to pose some interesting uh, questions for us all. Um, and one of the things we've been teaching you over the past few years is to try and make um, your labor instructions a lot simpler. Um, we need to look at planning for systemization, uh, for monitoring and for management. And we're looking at long-term and short-term goals with our labor. Um, where do you find your staff and where you're going to get them from? The RSEs or the um, island staff that we have in the country. At the moment, we've got uh, several thousand that can't get home. And when they go home, they may not be able to come back. So that's raising a lot of issues for us. You've got your own border controls and, and lack of movement. So um, if you've got tourists or backpackers that can't get out, then that's good. But what will happen later in the season? That's the key issue, especially under the COVID-19 and the way that it's flaring up again. So we all need to look at how we handle labour and how we're going to get around this issue going forward under the current environment. The short term labour solutions um, can be as simple as creating plans and, and uh, looking at your crop load. So you're only putting on the trees with the crop load you want, managing your vigour, um, have a plan for your pruning, your thinning and your harvest. And by doing accurate plans, you're better able to work out how many staff you needed. I think it's um, been driven home many, many times and meetings ago that um, we have very simple rules uh, for all the things that we do uh, with pruning. And I would like to think that people have got better at winter pruning simply because the rules have got simpler. We need to measure and monitor performance and keep a tab on it. The other point I'll make too is we got caught with a lot of um, islanders that couldn't go home. And so we were out telling people to actively do a better job with their winter pruning because they may not have the labour around to do the hand thinning. So uh, the point I make there is that tasks done well, particularly early in the season, can actually have a big benefit later on in keeping price and keeping wage costs and that lower. So uh, this is where artificial spur extinction or bud extinction or counting your buds. One of the little tools that we're using a lot is um, the BCA branch cross sectional area tool. Um, we're actually using that for bud counting. So we know how many fruit we want to put on a branch. We can measure the branch and work out how many buds we want to, want to put on it based on the number of uh, fruit we want at harvest time. So for something like Royal Gala, we might have one and a half bud numbers uh, for the amount of fruit we want. So it's using simple little tools to get quality of jobs and get closer to our target sooner. Longer term management is a bit more costly. Um, that involves um, new orchard systems, uh, looking at new varieties, uh, potentially looking at new sensors and robotic options, um, and looking at how we can reduce weights through excellent canopies. So in this one here, we're trying to um, look at the new technology that's there, platforms, you've all seen them. Uh, compared to the old ladder, and um, Jonathan made the point about Craig's analogy that uh, climbing up and down a ladder is like walking to base camp at Everest, and it still hasn't changed in many orchards for probably 80 or 90 years. Um, so by going to platforms and going to newer, more densely populated orchards, uh, you're looking at minimal movement, it's more motivational. Having said that, I've seen some uh, platforms that are very noisy with diesel engines, and it's not actually a pleasant environment to be in. So if you're looking at platforms, please consider the um, uh, environment that the staff are working in. That they shouldn't need to have to put on headsets um, simply because the motors are too loud, drowning them out. It can be very um, disturbing over time. And we need to keep looking to improve um, with our labor and our systems. 
So the next area, this sort of leads on to canopy design. Um, as Jonathan's put here, all canopies have strengths and weaknesses. Um, basically, uh, it doesn't really matter which canopy you go for, um, providing you can use it and you understand it. Um, the hardest part with most canopies is the understanding of it. The easy part that these newer systems and newer canopies um, pose is that they are easy for staff to follow because they don't have to understand the, the nuances of that. So um, we tend to look at the different systems that are around and try and work out which is going to be best. Um, for technology, um, we'll be correctly um, need to adapt for the orchards and the needs will be commercially available. Um, there is a lot of technology floated around, but it's not actually commercially available. And one of the interesting ones I've mentioned before, um, when we've had platforms brought in from Italy, when they break down, we can't service them because no one has parts. So when you buy a platform from overseas, you actually need to get some parts as well. They need to be cost effective. They need to be able to uh, create decisions or actionable outcomes. You need to focus on efficiency and be effective and adaptable to your orchard system. Something uh, that we need to work on together as a whole team. And at the end of the day, they need to be able to add value. One of the things that we're seeing more and more uh, with the price of labor going up even here is more and more uh, growers are actually spending capital to replace labor or make their labor more efficient. And there's a video clip um, on the Hotties Fruit Company that we've got to show after this, um, shows a platform pruning a 2D system and um, when you look at the movements the staff make there, I was really impressed about how they um, targeted buds and there was very little movement. There was no ladder work um, and they were just steaming down the rows. And I am aware of other growers in Australia using platforms to similar effects. So um, there is opportunity there for everybody. But when we're targeting a future orchard for 2040, there are a number of things that we need to uh, look at first. And, and there's a lot of research going on around the world one of the key things is why do we need to change? Well, um, in that first category there, I've got health. The health of the consumers and the general public, we need to be thinking more about them. We have social responsibilities, which are being placed on us more and more, and people are buying on social uh, needs. So it needs to be um, socially acceptable. And then the last one there is sustainable. Um, if it's not sustainable, we won't have an industry. So what should our focus be? Well, for some of you are looking to export, so you'll need to look at uh, more the global uh, demand. For those that are doing um, local, um, you'll need to look at the consumer's demands and their requirements. The interesting thing is that the local um, demands in that follow pretty closely what's happening globally. It might be a lag, but it's not often too far behind. So uh, being aware of what's going on globally will certainly make you uh, more attuned to what's going on locally or what's needed to be happening locally. Uh, we need integrated systems. We need all the pieces of the puzzle to fit together. We need to try and minimize zero waste and we need to concentrate on keeping taste and nutrition uh, to the forefront from growing apples and keep um, specifying that. I am aware of, um, as you will be aware that New Zealand exports the majority of its fruit and where we concentrate on vitamin C for some of our fruit, we're seeing very good demand in the marketplaces around the world, even though it's affected by COVID-19. So keep, uh, keep watching that uh, nutrition. And I'm interested with Nigel's uh, nitrogen leaching and things like that. Uh, in 2025, our orchards are gonna be faced with environmental plans, and it's gonna include water budgeting, it's gonna include nitrogen leaching, and uh, only putting on nutrients that are needed. So, there is a lot of change coming in our sector, and I would I would imagine that it will be coming to you as well. So how do we achieve this change going forward by 2040? Um, basically, there's uh, innovation and uh, technology and new things happening all the time, and I'll show you a little bit of a clip of some of those things. Um, like I said, this is part one of a part two talk. Ross and Craig will have more innovation to show in the September loop. We need to keep finding solutions. Um, and it can be as simple as a piece of string. Uh, those are trees I showed you earlier on about uh, when we first visited Australia and trees were all pointing at the sky and there's very little fruit on them. Uh, the cheap little bit of string uh, will pull the branches down and all of a sudden they started being fruitful. I also have a, a clip of um, some interesting uh, canopies which I'll show you as well. And we need to keep learning and apply from it. And I think we're all pretty good at that. I suppose one of the big lessons, uh, one of the big things that's been heartening with our involvement in Futures Orchards is uh, more and more growers are prepared to have a go at things and that's the way how you go forward. 
is pre be prepared to have a go at these different training systems and learn and share information with your neighbours because it really does speed up the cycle. The other issue we're getting is that um, policy either from government or from uh, consumers um, and, and starting to drive the fact that we have to change. And I just mentioned the environmental plans for nitrogen and nutrients and our water plans, uh, our good policy plans for staff employment, all those things are coming on. Now, one thing we do know from other industries that we monitor, um, if your leadership in your industry is strong and you're seen to be changing, uh, the consumers and the government will pretty much leave you alone. If you're laggard and you don't want to change, then eventually someone will force that on you. And we've had plenty of examples of that in the New Zealand industry. So how will it all come together? Well, there are four main areas that um, people are focusing on. Um, the first one there is uh, sensing, uh, data management, automation, and design. I'll run through each of them. So sensing, now it's not as if you're not doing sensing data anyway, or sensing yourselves anyway. You're already using your gumboots and you're out walking your orchards and you're looking at what's going on, you're studying your trees, you're trying to work it all out. But there's a heck of a lot of information going on there that can and will be packaged in the future. And I look at the fruit and flower counts, uh, soil biology, the productivity of your blocks. The more we can get and measure those matrices, the better off we'll be. The bottom right hand side there is actually um, an irrigation monitoring um, software reporting, which we supply growers and it just tells them how much water to put on and it shows you the soil profile of how water is going and how much um, your soil is getting wet or dry from the previous time. So there's lots of sensing happening, but there's a lot of work going on in research that is looking at sensing um, tools and options for growers. Here's one um, case that um, with the uh, top right hand side there, you have a, an orchard that's been flown by a drone and it's highlighted some different colors there. Each of those colors represent the figure of a tree. And um, we can then automatically set up the root pruner there on the left and it can go through and only root prune the trees that have excessive vigor. So it's some quite interesting technology that that's now starting to become available and more of these sorts of uh, ways, more of these tools have become op options for us all. What we've seen um, being in the front line for um, uh, technology is uh, data management. And um, we have been testing uh, for a few years a um, crop estimation tool the downside with the tool was it collected so much information, it took a long time to actually get, in, get anything meaningful from the tool. Um, it used quite a few computers and it was, um, was mind-boggling and complex. But all that will change over time. And we, we would see that data management will become easier, faster and quicker. And more decision uh, models, such as Sonata that's been floated this, today, um, those sorts of things will make life a lot easier for us all. It will improve the workforce planning. Um, in this, this example here, we've got OrchardNet, which you're all familiar with. But on the right-hand side here, it's just a little phone app that one of my staff developed, and it's for counting fruit, and it works very well. Um, and we've been using that, and then all the technology is put back onto the main computer, and then we're able to send property reports out to growth. So lots of little uh, cheap, innovative ways to get more data and then to make it more useful. I suppose we all manage data in our heads, but there's going to be a lot more of it and we need to sort of find ways to make it more accessible. Automation, um, there's a lot more happening in the automation front, as, as you've been aware of, um, from picking and grading. And I had a shed to spend $2 million recently in a fruit shed, um, changing to an automatic defect sorter. Um, really all they were doing was replacing 25 staff with uh, $2 million. Now it sounds pretty dear, but uh, they gained more productivity. They relocated those staff onto more dropping lanes and they increased their productivity by 50%. So they thought that was a pretty good spend and probably over a number of um, eight to 10 years, it, it will work out that way. The VR headsets are quite interesting. There is work going on with um, training people on how to prune trees um, uh, using that. So instead of going into an orchard, you can do a virtual reality pruning demonstration with them. So this is this sort of technology that's just around the corner. Uh, precision spraying and weed management, again, that'll come up probably in September with Craig and John. And then we're looking at how we can carry the sensors, whether they're fixed on trees or whether they're drones, ATVs, 
ATVs or whatever. Lots of different things happening in that space. Um, let me see if I can get that to go. As you can see, it's quite interesting um, technology. Um, it is very big and chunky at the moment, but the idea is to put um, four or five or even six of those robotic arms on a smaller machine that will pick day and night. Um, so yeah, lots of interesting things happening in that space. That's not the only one, there are other technologies out there. So how will this all come together again when we look at orchard design? And um, lots of things are happening with orchard designs, uh, the Washington V, but it basically needs to be suitable for labour, um, needs to be profitable, needs to be sustainable. Um, here are different systems you've got there, um, the vase shape or V, uh, if you're a V trellis system, uh, fruiting walls such as 2Ds, um, the Fox system out of Tustin and New Zealand plant and food, and then the super spindle, tall spindle. They all have their merits and they all um, have opportunity. Um, at the end of the day, uh, varieties and canopies, um, what we need to do is just make life simpler. Um, we need to manage our climate, we need to meet the customer's quality, um, and we need to look for things that are profitable in production. And this shot here, I think this was the most picking platforms in any one orchard at any one time in the US. Uh, it would cost a, a fair bit, but uh, some of those orchards are pretty big. And we need to get more efficient with our labour. So lots of opportunities with technology. Um, these two slides, these two photos here, uh, electronic mapping, which was before orchards were planting, highlights uh, lots of different things. It highlights the differences in the soil quality. It highlights uh, topography. So we're able to do drainage. We're able to choose rootstocks that match the soil type. We're able to put our irrigation monitoring uh, systems or sensors in the right soil types. So we cover the, uh, all the variation. And, and the list goes on and on what you can do from these EM mapping. Uh, picking machines you've seen before, but uh, that's coming more to the fore as the training systems get simpler. Um, and then we get orchard maps listing our productivity. Finally, um, this is a fruiting wall here um, that's in the video clip I've um, put up that you'll be able to see. And basically we turned an existing orchard into a fruiting wall. Yes, the spacing is not correct, but it's too wide at five meters, but it did make life a lot simpler for the orchard as it brought fruit closer to the ground and it has proven very worthwhile. If we had our time again, we would pull out and replant a lot closer, but there are cheaper options and this option here was very cheap. Um, as I say, change and new technologies are, are inevitable. Um, there will always be plenty of options uh, providing you're willing to learn. So thank you, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, you've identified a lot of decision-making points um, in your, I guess, summary of the last five years of, or four years of the, the current Future Orchards project and provided some really interesting insights, I think, in term, into how things might change in terms of environmental plan requirements for orchards and also um, changing consumer demands and, um, and the changes in technology as well. In, in yours and, and I guess Ross's experience over the last 10 years or more, can you identify anywhere that Australian growers in particular have made the greatest improvements? And is there, are there any, say one or two key, key areas where growers in Australia can focus in, on into the future to continue to be globally competitive? Or is that too simplistic a question and it really depends on each grower's individual resources and requirements? And I think it's a good, good question, Rose. But I think the interesting thing is that uh, since Futures Orchard has started, the thing that's changed most is growers are now prepared to give it a go. And there are lots of things that we've promoted. There's lots of things we've shown and, and the overseas guests have shown, but basically giving things a go. And um, 
you know, I, I remember when we first, uh, first started talking about training branches down and using string and the looks of horror we got from that. Now, when you go into orchards, they're putting more posts in because the trees are falling down because they're overladen with fruit. So there is lots of opportunities uh, for us to adopt simple and easy technology. Uh, the point is, I suppose, we've just got to keep learning and that's the opportunity for Australia. A lot of their orchards are world-class now and Ross has got the figures from the orchard business analysis and the databases to show that. And that's been very encouraging. doesn't mean it's an easy road, but um, it's certainly moving in the right direction. And there's a lot more innovation in Australia from what we can see today to what we saw 10 years ago. And that's hopefully what our, we try to be a catalyst to is just to create change and keep that innovation going. There's no one size fits all as far as um, orchards go and you, you're allowed to do whatever you want as long as you can make it work. The only thing is the pressure is coming on with costs and increased um, production, costs from increasing labour and wages and eventually you need to work out whether you can make it or not, whether you have the capacity to get the production or not and you have the um, varieties that command the premiums in the marketplace. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge but uh, we all face it all the time. Yeah, we've got a, a question here regarding the fruit counting app that you um, mentioned in your presentation. Is that available for people or can they get in touch with you to find out more? Or is that yeah, we could, we could uh, organise that. It's a, one of my staff made it who's pretty clever. So um, I say you always should employ people smarter than yourself. So <laughs> we're obviously doing that. Um, but no, she, she's made this app and, and it's a very simple little app that collects the information really well for us. And, it, and everyone's got phones in it now. So again, it's using technology that everyone has. So um, maybe yeah. just get in touch with Susie or myself at APAL and we'll put you in touch with Steve to, to talk about that a bit more. Um, there's also, it's a quite a lengthy um, question, which I'm not sure if I should read out all the, the numbers and things, but uh, it's about um, wages and, and so on that have just changed in, in Australia. So the questions, I guess you, you can probably read the details if you need to yourself, but the questions are what proportion of farm gate costs on the blocks or maybe this is more for the um, the videos as well later, but what proportion of the farm gate cost on the blocks featured um, are wages and what proportion of that is profit? And if wages are increased to match Australian costs, would these blocks still be profitable considering that it would be likely to decrease at the farm gate by 10 to 15% because of increased post-harvest costs? So maybe we'll save that for the videos. Yeah, well, Ross might have a quick answer to that because I have mentioned it to him. But one of the things that's happening now with our orchard design, um, I saw a leading grower, we had a visit with a leading grower, Ross was with us at the time, and he was setting up uh, with a bee trellis to grow 100 to 120 tonnes of fruit. And I asked him why, when that's the yield we're doing now, shouldn't we be looking at 140 to 160 tonnes? And so therefore they straight away went and engineered stronger end support systems and stronger structure so they could handle the increased yield. Now, whether we'll get to that yield, uh, custom from plant and food sense to think uh, we will under this, this system that he's advocating. Um, but we need to sort of future-proof our system so that we can get there. And as many growers have seen, um, by actually planting the rootstocks in closer and getting the tree rows denser, it is very cheap or a lot cheaper to um, regraft an orchard and rework it over to a more profitable variety than have wider spaces where you can't work. So, but I'll we'll pass on to Ross, he knows a bit more of the money because he's been following the um, orchard business analysis results, commenting on that, Ross. Um, yeah, Rose, the, uh, this question is a really good question. It's quite a detailed question. And the, the anonymous provider, I see it's anonymous. Uh, I know David. that we've just typed it in because it was sent by email. Anyway, um, uh, we had, we knew this one was coming, so I did a little bit of homework. But um, and I've got a um, I've got an overall statement. I always used to say that orchard profitability was based on the three P's, and the three P's were productivity or production, pack out, which is quality, and price, which is making sure you've got the right variety, the right size, etc. But I think there's a fourth one now, and um, and it's the question that this person's raised, and it's really top of our mind at the moment too and it is about it is about labor efficiency and um, uh, the point that uh, the question makes is that the minimum wage rate in Australia is now effectively 28 Australian dollars per hour um, and uh, that obviously really concerns the person who's put the question in 
the um, uh, the same rate in New Zealand in Australian dollars is nineteen dollars. Okay, so it's uh, it's significantly lower, and and unfortunately, we've done wage analyses of of countries that produce apples around the world, Australia is the highest wage cost of an apple producing nation in the world. Uh, and New Zealand's number two. Okay, so we're both high wage cost economies. And, and the point that's been made by the question answer is, if New Zealand's wage cost was to increase to the Australian wage cost, would we be able to make profits? And you'll see some videos uh, these are some good performing blocks. Uh, I've looked at the average because it's more typical, but effectively, if, if we had to pay the Australian cost of labour and we got the New Zealand return that we're getting, we would be in trouble. Uh, there's no question about that. We'd be in trouble. So what we're returning in terms of an export value for the product, if we were getting the, if we were having to pay the Australian labour cost it would make it much more marginal. Um, interestingly, to make the Australians that are listening feel a little bit better, the Australian average return for apples is, is significantly higher than what the New Zealand grower gets in terms of returns too. So actually, when you look at the percentages of wages to your income, the both countries are very, very similar. But... What does it mean going forward? It means that we need to get the three P's right, but man, have we got to get this labor efficiency thing right? Absolutely as well. And um, some of these videos that we're about to show next uh, are trying to address um, some of those questions. That was a great question. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, Susie, we, Ross, we might come back to you after the video. Susie, um, we'll hand over to you now. So Susie is going to present an update on the trials that she's been conducting in Western Australia. Okay, thanks, Rose. Um, yeah, welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us at the WA Future Orchards virtual walk. Many thanks go to Larissa Vaughan and Rose Daniel at APAL for taking care of all, of all the behind the scenes work to make today happen. Big thank you to goes to Ross Wilson and Steve Sparks for showing us the New Zealand orchards. It's great to have a pruning demonstration this time of year, and I'm sure you're all going to enjoy this part of the webinar. We, def no, my screen's wrong. we definitely have great memories from our Pine West trip in New, Ze in New Zealand in 2018. Righto. Okay. So, part of the Future Orchards project includes undertaking observational trials and demonstrations in our region. Today I'm going to go, two, go through two of our trials we did in WA, predicting lens cell damage and water use, growth rate and taste. Predicting lens cell damage trial was driven by the WA industry concern for the increasing amount of lens cell damage occurring in Kansi apples in the 2019 season. So this trial was really done as a Pine West trial, but has turned out really well, which is why I submitted it into the future orchard system. Lentil cell damage is expressed after post-harvest handling, but as a result of what happens pre-harvest. If we can predict what's going, on, going to happen in the cool store, decisions can be made on how to, to manage the fruit coming out of cool store. This trial was set, set up to investigate three methods of predicting lentil cell damage that have been trialled by Washington State University for Honeycrisp Athball. Okay, so three weeks prior to harvest, the Kansi apples we were sampled, so we had 100 fruit taken from three orchards. Two had had previous damage last year, and one had had no damage last year. There were 30 apples per treatment. The methods included, okay, so we had the hot water treatment. So the apples have submerged into hot water, so at 49 degrees for 30 minutes. Then we had the epstein method. So apples were dipped in an ethereal solution for two seconds. And then the passive method, on the, which were the apples were laid on the bench at room temperature. And then we had the control. So this is just the percentage of fruit with damage after three or coming out of cool store now. Fruit were then placed into fruit boxes in, in the lab at room temperature and monitored for 21 days. Okay, our results from the three orchards tested. Orchard one showed the greatest amount of damage rising to 13% at day 21 for the Epstein method. 
7% for the passive method and 3% damage for the hot water treatment. In the Epstein method, damage began to occur at 15 days after treatment. All orchards responded to the Epstein method with orchard two and three showing 3% of the apples damage, 3% of apples damage. When the, the Kansi apples came out of the cool store for the 2020 season, the percentage of damage after three weeks was, orchard one had 14% of apples with lenticel damage, orchard two, 10% and orchard three, 3%. All methods showed a response and were able to predict there would be some damage to the fruit coming out of cool store, but the Epstein method had a more marked effect. And when you look at the cool store results and the results from the treatments, the passive method followed the trend and then the hot water treatment. Okay, so we did some nutrient uptake tests were undertaken at the time of sampling to better understand the nutritional balances between apple shoots and fruits. The shoot tips showed a higher calcium in the shoot tips at Orchard 1. This is usually a sign of a vigorous trees and the calcium here needed to be in the fruit at this time of year, not in the shoots. The fruit results. So we, we tested the apples at the same time as well. So Orchard 2 had the highest calcium in the fruit and the lens cell damage is associated with low fruit calcium. Orchard 3 had high magnesium and potassium which promotes lentil cell damage at these cations, as these cations compete with calcium. And Orchard 1 had the lowest fruit calcium and below detectable limits of nitrates, reducing the calcium partition from the shoots to the fruit. Hence, all, hence Orchard 1 had the highest damage, but all orchards showed some damage through the season. All right, so we'll move to the next, our next trial, which is the water use, growth rate and taste. This trial was set up after the COG asked when it was the best time to stop watering before harvest. So instead of going straight in and approaching a, grow, a grower to reduce their water input on a bay, I set out to define what the current water use of the orchards in southwest of WA was. So we were able to monitor seven orchards using different watering systems, drip under tree sprinkler, different environments, net, no net, at three different locations. The trial involved measuring water applied over the, seven, over the season on seven orchards. We recorded irrigation, rainfall, evapotranspiration, inputted into a simple water bounce calculator and used the orchard net water use model. We measured fruit size, gala and pink lady, and we did maturity tests, including a dry matter content, and did some taste testing of the gala apples. We're also supposed to do some pink lady taste testing today, but we we're unable to do that because of the COVID-19 restrictions. Okay, so the fruit sizing group were asked to step up this year, not only to record fruit size from their selected blocks, but also to record watering hours too. Most growers in the group had a pink lady and a gala blocked, and these blocks selected for the taste testing, was sexual taste testing. We collected rainfall and evapotranspiration, and these were recorded from the deep herd weather station site for the nearest weather station to the orchard. And this data is available to everybody from the Ag Web's Deep Herd website. We did a simple water balance calculation, was undertaken at each orchard, measuring the, measuring the water coming in via irrigation and rainfall, and the water going out via evapotranspiration. The calculation can be used as a good cross-reference on irrigation being applied and making sure that it's optimal and verifying the monitoring system if it's in place. And we then use the effective irrigation in millimetres per week. Okay, so we inputted this. So the rainfall, the ET and the irrigation, we inputted into the orchard net, mod, into the orchard net on, on the water, water centre. And this graph was developed for each, each orchard. So you can see that the yellow is the um, evapotranspiration, the light blue is the irrigation, the dark blue is the rainfall, um, the red line is the individual growers crop factor and the, the dark line is the average of all, all the inputted. So here we have the irrigation, the total annual irrigation deficit, so we have, which is the evapotranspiration minus the rainfall minus the irrigation. And apples required this to be 100% of ET plus 10% for apple growth. The evapotranspiration, or oh, sorry, Orchard E had the had irrigation and rainfall almost equaled the evapotranspiration, but we can, as we can see here, it had the highest dry matter at 17.5%, but 
but the smaller scala fruit, but the largest pink lady fruit. Orchards, so the two Pemberton orchards and the other Manjimup orchards were able to achieve a good irrigation deficit within plus or minus of 100 mils, so ensuring they had good fruit growth, but did include some of the smaller scala and some of the smaller pink lady in there as well. When we go down to orchard F and G at Newlands, the highest irrigation deficiency, where they've got the highest irrigation deficiency, so they're up around the 300s millimetres, um, they also had the highest evapotranspiration, but they, we also have the largest pink lady there at 83 mils, and their, the gala apples were fairly average as well. So it didn't necessarily mean that they were going to have smaller fruit with their high irrigation deficiency. Here we have our accumulated irrigation deficit. It is the total irrigation deficit over the season. And as we can see, before Christmas, the accumulated irrigation deficit needs to remain about 100 mils per week. And as you can see in this graph, the water used by, by the galas and some orchards became very deficient in water very early. So they can see this the two new lands orchards here taking off very quickly. We had some extreme heat in November and December. It's very uncharacteristic at this time of year. And the impact of this heat can be seen throughout the season with the accumulated irrigation deficiency increasing right throughout the season. Okay. We go to the next graph. This one here tells us that this is the accumulated diff irrigation deficit for the whole season. And most orchards followed the same pattern that they started off on from the beginning of the season throughout. So the last part of the project was to do the taste testing of the gala apples. And this took place after all samples have been picked and the testing pack panel consisted of growers, apple breeders, local consumers, using the scoring sheet that we had used at the fruit quality orchard walk a couple of years ago. So each apple was scored and the following criteria, texture, juiciness, sweetness, flavour and the chance of purchasing again. The taste pre taster's preference was variable and depending upon the age and the apple eating experience. Sample A, which is our, the, the red one there, um, was the most favourable, followed by sample C, then sample E. There was no correlation can be seen between the different watering systems or environments. Um, and as you can see that this information we've collected over the season now sets us up really well to input into Nigel's Sonata model um, that has been developed that we've heard about this morning. So we can insert all these watering, then be able to insert watering strategies over the top of the data that we've, we've collected, um, which will then can improve fruit size, yields and costs. Um, and hopefully we'll see you all again back in the orchard in September. When we, and we'll be back to see the apples on apples, core pick room, biofumigate and beneficial bacteria site at Fontanini's. Thanks for listening. Is there any questions? Thanks very much, Susie. Some really interesting um, results coming out of your trials. And I can see how um, what Nigel's been doing can fit in very nicely with what you guys are doing there. And, and I can see where the lentisol question came in as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the interest of time, we haven't got any questions, but if you do have any questions, please reach out to Susie. Um, I'm sure you all know how to get in touch with her um, and ask her, um, it, or get in touch with her if you've got any other questions that, to follow up on what she's just presented. We're going to head over to New Zealand now, where Ross and Steve will take us through one of their, or a couple of their orchards in, in New Zealand. Yeah, so this hoddy orchard is a Nelson orchard. Um, Susie, some you and some of the growers would have seen it when you were here in 2018. It's a 2D orchard. Um, they've been 15 years in the making and uh, the majority of their planting is all 2D. And um, Kevin, the orchard uh, with the technical manager, uh, will highlight some of the um, reasons why they do that in the video clip. So, yep, enjoy. with Kevin Witherton from Hotties Fruit Company. Yep. Yep. So Kevin, just explain a bit about your role and what you do and a bit about the 2D system here. So I run all the spray programs at uh, plant health and protection uh, and heavily involved with the, the um, management uh, team um, coming up with what we do sort of day to day really. Um, the 2D system that we're growing uh, here we're 
about 15 years in now, I think. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, it's been a natural sort of progression. Um, you know, so it's basically an eight wire system, um, planting entities 2.5 metres wide in the row and about 1.2 between trees, 1.2 metres. And then we have our eight wires sort of running up, up uh, as an Australia sort of system. Uh, and we basically just train the branches onto the wires and um, that, that keeps our windows open for light. And then, yeah, we just um, come up with a number between trees of what we think those um, that area should handle for our crop loading. So what variety have we got on here? So we've got Royal Gala here yep. today. Yep. Um, so, yeah. And like for pruning at the moment, we're targeting 25 to 30 buds between uh, trunks. Yep. So per wire, and that's the equivalent of a tree. Yep. So if we match from there to there, then yep. that's, there is a bit of variability, obviously, yep. but um, that's how that works. So yep. when we're trying to come up with, um, you know, how we prune it, we're just trying to sort of favour our our spur units with these short little darts that have a nice uh, fat terminal bud on the end. Um, trying to work through a bit of hand spacing yep. and just trying to favour the uh, buds and material coming out the sides of the branches. Yep. Um, so we have our bud number there and then within that we just have a few sort of specific rules as in trying to keep the pencil thickness where we can for the thickness of the wood so that um, it's strong enough to, to hold yep. the fruit. Um, and also height and width um, restrictions around how long we leave the units. Yep. Um, so as an example, that one there, it's it's more than a secateur length, which is what we try and use. It's something that we've got on us. And um, so then I'll just remove that one off the side and favour the, the outward facing one. Sometimes we trim things back a little bit in, in preparation for the next year, so it might not be very good for cropping this year, yep. um, but that'll give up, cover our bases for next year. And how we've achieved these is just basically by tipping um, a lot of the annual growths. You know, once upon a time that would have been a, 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 a lateral shoot there, yep. just a one year piece and we've just tipped it, yep. and then that makes them push out a wee bit and spur up into yep. to, to what we want. What rootstock are these on? Um, got a mixture, I think they're mostly M9s. M9s, yep. yeah. So they're relatively quite. Do you regardless at all? Do you yep. hold the bigger bit? Yep. Of that? Plenty of regardless. A yep. couple of yep. applications of that. Yep. Summer um, pruned as well? Uh, not a lot. We used to do quite a bit of summer pruning, but we um, find we don't really need to. Yep. Yep. Um, they, they crop so heavily, it's, it's in excess of 80 or 90 tonnes yep. every year. Yep. And some of the other varieties, certainly all of that and, and more. Um, what do you find are the pluses of this 2D system? The biggest sort of benefits the fruit quality, I think. Yep. Um, you know, the, the size distribution's generally a lot more even than um, sort of other, other growing systems. systems. Yep. Um, and yeah, just more uniformity. Yep. Um, we, we pick out virtually every apple, yep. so the lighting section is really good. Yep. Um, good. Good dry matter and fruit quality, and good colour and size. The basics, really. So, with your 25 buds between there to there, how many fruit would you expect to pick? Uh, it's about 20. Yep. Yep. So, 20 times otherwise is 100. 60 apples, and yep. then we have our extra units that yep. come off the trunk here and there. Yep. Um, and so I think 180 fruits you know, fill up there yep. in, in tonnage. So um, yeah, around that sort of thing. Have you found any um, negatives from the system that you've been using? Anything that you do again or do differently? No. no. So I, I think we, yeah, yep. we. We've looked at other systems as well, and we we like what we're doing with the, the 2D, and it's working well for us. So we're, we're you've got to understand it, yeah, know it now, yeah. so it's second nature. Yeah, yep. Yep. Works um, 
Yeah, you know, it's, it's really easy to train people as well because yeah. you just you give a number there and then you sort of yeah. it's easy to count, and monitor, and, yes, yeah. and all the yeah. things yeah. Are, are much sort of easier. Do you run long branches long, or are you shorten them up? Is that the norm now? Or uh, it's a bit of both. Yeah. It depends on sort of the the vigour of the tree a wee bit too. Yep. Um, and what, what you've got to cut to, but generally a bit of a gap in the middle is, is good. Yep. Um, but yeah, depending on, on the age of the branch and that. Yep. Um, yeah. So. so you just prune that one there? Or that side so done pretty, pretty there. easy that one there, we just, yeah. just work our way along. Just so you're eliminating buds and weak wood? Yep, correct. Yep. Just coming back into them. That might be one that I'd leave alone yep. or, or just give it a wee shorten. Yep. That's, that's basically it for that one. And if I do a quick count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. 23, 24. Close. Yeah. And often we'll, you know, depending on branch size, we might end up with 15 buds if yep. it's not a full yep. wire. Um, and up the top, uh, quite often I end up at about 30, 32. Yep. Just trying to hang a little bit more bud up there where the vigour is at the top of the tree. Yep. Um, just to keep the car up, really. Uh, and, and the bottoms are definitely a lot sort of weaker than the top as with any other system as well. So. I think that last image of that platform working with a cover over the top with people doing simple pruning rules uh, speaks pretty loudly to me, actually. Um, but we're going to take you, uh, I'm going to open up my soul. They said a New Zealand walk. Um, but I'm actually going to take you for a walk on, um, on one of my, uh, well, one of my blocks, one of the properties. So uh, expect lots of questions. Or, um, uh, or a little bit of banter at the end. So here we go. Uh, good afternoon, my name's Ross Wilson, uh, and many of you will already know me as a consultant with AdFirst, but um, today I've got my, well, I haven't got my grower hat on, actually, I've got my AdFirst hat on. But I'm, Special to you as the grower. Uh, so we've got an orchard as well, 20 hectares planted, it's all apples. And as you'll see as Jack scans around, we've got a, uh, a range of plantings on our orchard, ranging from very old stuff over here on the right, um, right through to some, um, some twin stem intensive trees. Uh, anyway, um, uh, the reason for this video is to focus in on one block of trees on Sun Peach Orchard. It's a block of Envy. Uh, been in the ground two and a half years. They've just completed their third leaf. Um, and we reckon it's a pretty stunning block. It's a, it's a twin stem block, as you can see. Uh, each tree was planted with two stems from the nursery. That was, a, that was critical. Um, it's a three metre wide row spacing. And that's all designed because we we want to bring down the size of our trees even further. We don't want them we don't want them overly tall. Uh, we want them narrow, so we've brought the row spacing into three meters. The tree spacing in the row is 1.5 meters, and with the twin stem, it means each stem is 75 centimeters apart. I haven't got the numbers straight off the top of my head, but it's something like 2,000. 200 trees per hectare, but it's actually 4,400 stems per hectare. Isn't that, uh, we're very fortunate this particular land is virgin land, got to make that clear, that's one of the reasons it's performed so well. Um, but we really looked after the trees in year one, you know, and we think we got the water right, we, uh, uh, you know, we used a little bit of GA3 to promote growth, I mean, all the, all the basic things. We also kept a very tight powdery mildew program. Okay, so uh, you get your spacing right and you've got the variety right. One, one of the good things about Envy, of course, you all know it, it grows a very big apple, uh, as you can see. Um, so, um, you know, this, this last year, 300 gram apple, so you don't need too many of them uh, 
you, you don't certainly don't need as many of these as you do other varieties to get tonnage but anyway uh, this might blow a few people away but it just shows you the potential uh, in the second leaf the second leaf 18 months after planting this block uh, produced 40 ton to the hectare uh, and in the third leaf just gone uh, 82 tons per hectare at about an 82 percent class one pack out a 300 gram average fruit size which is right in the slot for envy and also uh, 70 percent high grade color so fantastic fruit quality as well as a great volume anyway this year 80 tons last year we think it's got the capability this year if you look at the canopy uh, to do uh, about the 100 tons 100 tons a hectare another 20 tons more not a huge increase um, 100 tons per hectare works out at 80 pieces of fruit per stem that's assuming a 280 gram average piece which envy is capable of doing so um, 80 pieces of fruit per stem then the question becomes how many of these buds do we need to leave in the tree? With a tree of this age, with still a lot of uh, one-year wood in it, um, I think I'd be happy with it being somewhere around 1.5 to 1.7 buds per fruit. So that's what we're targeting. Now we've got to try and prune the trees uh, to get the best buds that we can in the tree to grow the best possible fruit. So now we'll have a go at, um, at doing some pruning. What we've identified in this flock is the tops of the trees are uh, really doing really nice quite naturally. So there's very little that we have to take out of the top. Um, all we'll be doing in the top is identifying the branches that are too steep, that are unlikely to come over with fruit weight. That's a branch there that's very steep, unlikely to come over with fruit weight, so we'll be We'll be removing that. This is the sort of branching in the top that we're trying to encourage. This nice flat branching. In the tops, we're largely removing the very steep branches. Um, and that's largely going to be it. Our biggest issue this year is in the bottoms of these trees. And in, in this particular tree, there are a lot of branches in the bottom of the tree. Okay. We believe we've just, we've just got too much clutter in this part of the tree that light environment's not good enough and we've got to open this up. So when we, when we look at this tree, uh, the decisions we've got to make is of, of this clutter of branches here, you know, if we're going to remove some and get some better spacing, which one is the best one to remove? Now remember, this is at a tight row spacing. It's only three meters apart and it's only 0.75, so we're looking to carry the smaller wood, not the bigger wood. And you'll notice that this piece of wood here, quite a vigorous piece of wood, it's had to have been shortened up. Uh, this cut was done last season to actually enable tractor access. Now, if we leave that piece of wood in, the vigor on the end of this branch is just going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. So I'm much better in to leave these weaker units uh, so this cut, that one there for me, is a remover. Now if I look further in this branch, I've got, um, I've got a reasonable branch here. These are all quite high quality branches. Um, and this one here, if you see it, this one is very, very pendant and become very, uh, very weak. And there's a better branch sitting over the top. So I'm going to remove that little pendant one. Um, the same with that little pendant one in there. You know, that sort of fruit on a very pendant branch like that's not going to be very good. So I'm removing the very, very strong one and the very, very weak ones. I'm tending to leave the branches that are the sort of middle caliper and they're all in their own space. And then, um, then, you, then I've got to make a decision. I've got to be able to tell my pruner is having one, two, three branches in the same place uh, too much and, and is that going to enable me to colour the fruit on that particular branch um, I'm going to leave that decision until the very end because that's getting down to the marginal stuff um, this, is a quite a, this is quite a good branch the other rule that I want to give my pruners is um, remove the large 12 o'clock shoots the upright shoots and also remove 
the, um, the, the shoots underneath. That's on the branch. So here we have a nice branch with nice fruiting buds on it. What I want the pruner to do is to remove the 12 o'clock shoots off that. And, and um, in that case, I'm happy with that branch now as it is. Here in the upper tree, I've got, I also have a rule that we've had no more than one branch coming out of the leader at one place. So here's a classic where they're all pieces of one-year-old wood, all come from a cut. I'll remove the steep ones and leave the flat one. And this being envy, you'd be surprised, put three apples on that each at 280 or 300 grams, that, that will roll down into that position next season. That's too steep. Leave a little, um, and that's too steep, right? So they both come out. Here we have, here's the branch, two uprights on the branch. Both the uprights come off, and I leave the side little dart shoots here with a nice big terminal bud on the side. That's the ones that I want to leave. So now that's a nice branch. Now on that side of the tree, um, if I look, if I look down at the bottom, I've left this little weak one here. I probably, you know, this is getting close to the ground, do a little shortening cut on that. Um, there's a 12 o'clock here. And on that side of the tree, I'm, uh, I'm now pretty happy. Okay, we're just uh, now scanning down a bay of pruned trees. Uh, we've done some counts. We're sitting at about 1.5 to 1.7 buds per fruit. Uh, which is a ratio that we're happy with. Didn't, wouldn't want to go any harder than that. Um, and you'll see we've achieved what we set out to, to achieve. Uh, every branch in its own space, uh, good access, um, and high quality buds throughout the whole tree. Is there anything, anything you'd like to, um, no, no questions coming through at the moment, Ross, are there any comments that you or Steve would like to make or Susie, even if there's anything that um, is particularly relevant to Western Australia, are there any comments that you'd like to make or questions to raise? I'd just like to make a comment, Rose, that um, to reinforce what you've said, we, we couldn't come to WA and do an orchard walk, and we regret that because we really like doing the orchard walks. Um, but uh, we thought the next best thing was to video some orchard walks in New Zealand. There will be six of them in total. We've just shown two today. Uh, there's one still in production, but the other, so all, about five of them are up on the website now. So um, sorry about the quality today. Uh, a bit jittery today, but hopefully when you're on a good internet connection home, you go onto the website, you'll get the uh, video quality come through um, uh, good and nice. So, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, um, we've got, what have we got? We've got five minutes uh, before we have to end, unless you've got something, but it'd be really good to see the odd question pop up uh, for those of you that are online. So um, encourage that, but back to you, Rose. If anyone, if anyone has any questions, if this was your opportunity to see Ross's own orchard, so bring out the questions, I say. Um, otherwise, if, if no one's... Oh, here we go. Look at that, Ross. Look out. <laughs> it's uh, in the wrong tab. Um, <laughs> Mark's, Mark says he feels like he's hogging all the questions, so maybe someone else has got some as well. Do you think that the closer stems and smaller wood might be easier to manage in the long term? Um, yeah, I can, I can answer that. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, the old trees, the old five by three trees are, are very, you know, the old wide spacing, they're very complex trees. They're quite hard for people to understand. So these smaller trees that have simpler branch units, uh, yes, should be easier to manage from a labor perspective. And, and a lot of people have gone you know, what Steve showed gone in that direction on a more, a bit, even more formal system, just because of the ease of management instructions with labor. Um, so yes, I absolutely think that that's one reason we, we, we are moving in this direction. 
Okay. Um, if there are no other questions in the interests of Zoom exposure, we might wind it up now. If you've got any questions for Ross or Steve after this, and particularly once you've watched the videos more clearly, hopefully, um, from the website, please get in touch with them. There are some really nice videos and there, there are four others um, that, that are either already available or will become available in the next week or so. So go and have a look on the APAL website and at those um, and pass any questions on to Ross or, or Steve or add first from that. Okay, so that's all we've got time for today. Um, I'd like to thank Nigel, Steve, Ross and Susie for sharing their experiences and research outcomes. It's been a really interesting orchard walk. As we mentioned, you can find today's presentations and those videos on the Future Orchards Library on the APAL website. And the recording of today's session will be made available um, in a few days. And thank you to all of you out there for participating. We know it's a slightly unusual way to do an orchard walk and hopefully we'll be able to see you in person next time. We'll be conducting a short evaluation at the end of this session as you exit. You'll see a little pop-up box directing you to an online survey and we'd appreciate if you can take a few minutes to complete it because your feedback is very valuable to us. We'd also like to acknowledge um, Hort Innovation because this <laughs> Orchards program is funded by the Apple and Pear R&D levy and contributions from the Australian government and managed by Hort Innovation. APAL has more webinars coming up over the next few months. So you can see a summary of these here and find more information about these on the APAL website under the events tab. If you've got anything that you're particularly interested in, please let us know. In the meantime, stay healthy and we hope that we can see you uh, in the upcoming webinars and on the next Future Orchards in September, which will hopefully be in person. Yeah, thanks very much.